in the icon. Let's, let's talk about them uh, one at a time. All right. Um, inter, uh, w which one did you want to address first? Uh, what tool to use on a Mac to create it? Uh, I do a lot of stuff in, in the GIMP, which is the GIMP, G-I-M-P, which is a open source package that is, you know, of professional quality uh, editing. So it's, it's comparable to Photoshop. Um, it, it's, it's very good. So that's what I use typically for almost all my uh, image processing. Because, you know, I can't afford to buy fancy old software. All right, so GIMP.org. And if you look, again, they, they talk about what you can do. It, I mean, it, it's full-blown like Photoshop. You can make layers. You can do transparencies. You know, just about anything that you can, uh, that, that you would want to do, you, you can do with it. It's a really uh, very powerful um, application. So I would suggest using that. All right. Other questions about the icon creation. Uh, I've incorporated these, that activity into the next assignment. We'll talk about the next assignment. The next assignment, I want you to, to show the icon you've done and, and do the internationalization. Um, what guidelines did you find for making a icon? What, what, what makes for a good icon? Yeah, all right. Keep it very simple. Right. 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 Keep, yeah. Okay. Right. You need, uh, you need different images for the different densities. Keep it simple. Um, it's not the time to show your artistic skills and, 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 and do shadowing and shading and stuff like that because that's not really going to do you any good. Uh, there's a couple on the uh, Android developers uh, site. There's there's a couple good. Uh, yeah, I, I did want to uh, point it out to you in case you you went elsewhere. But yeah, the Android Android uh, icon design guidelines is a good one to visit. First of all, you should create a separate icon sets for high, medium, and low density. In addition to that, um, you can even create a, a higher res version for your, um, if you're going like, to upload it to the store so that, that folks can see uh, that. Um, actually, when we're talking about icons, we're talking about the launcher icon specifically, all right, because that's what's going to appear on the desktop. Um, Again, here's the naming convention to use. So they suggest that you use that naming convention. Use vector shapes when possible. Um, this isn't a graphics class, but vector shapes are shapes that are represented by mathematical formulas instead of represented by like bitmaps. Um, and, and therefore, they, they tend to resize uh, themselves better. Okay. Alright. <laughs> How did you figure it out then? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the, the GIMP I do not believe uses vector art. All right, I believe the, the GIMP uses all raster um, art. One thing they say is when you scale it, 
uh, go in and redraw it. That, that just, you know, in other words, as you make it smaller, clean it up. All right? To make it crisper at higher densities. Well, I would start with big and then make smaller versions, so I'm not sure if that would work. Uh, this link shows some good examples of it if I am. Oh, here we go. Goal of the launcher icon, promote the brand, help the user discover, and function well in the launcher. All right, unique and memorable, a color scheme that suits your brand. Don't try to say too much. This is definitely um, a very important guideline. <laughs> Avoid putting the application name in the icon. That will be displayed underneath it. So, um, as a general rule, I would avoid like words too much. You know, because again, you know, they they kind of uh, uh, it's going to be hard to read um, um, that. They do suggest using, um, not necessarily making them a square. Uh, you have the square area to do it in, but you can go and make it um, like with transparency so that the background uh, shows through. Um, let's look at some icons and briefly critique them. Again, this isn't a graphic design class, but you know, that's important. You know, in software development, any kind of smart software development, you know, you have your strengths and then you, you fake the rest. All right, so uh, we should at least know enough about graphic design so that you can fake and create a, a good icon if you need to. All right, zoom in. I'm looking at this one, smart remote. All right, uh, notice that the icon uh, is not a, a square, but is actually a circle. I mean, the image file would be a square, but is transparent around it. Um, typically, these will be stored as PNG files. And if you look at most of these, have sort of uh, non-square uh, backgrounds or, or uh, images. <laughs> Navigation, use common symbols. few of them do very good with like branding. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Like the Kindle, that's consistent with, with all their stuff. All right. That's about it with, with icons. Uh, I do, um, I, uh, the next assignment I want you to roll these changes uh, into it. As far as localization, um, how did that go? Any issues with that? You were talking a little bit about, about the one. And we can we can we can talk about that maybe a little bit now, and then we can we can um, discuss it um, uh, you know more on a one on one basis uh, after class. But uh, in a nutshell, I mean it's pretty straightforward to just do the user interface piece. Um, I, wasn't, uh, I, I didn't really have that much time to do it. Mm -hmm. and I wasn't really sure. So you have your screen side and not really screen Right. Right click. Oh, right click on the value folder, right. And then copy. Oh, new. XML. Now you go and give it uh, the name and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I did it. Uh, I did it. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, in different folders. Yeah, different folders. It's going to create a new folder based on the step right after there. Oh. Yeah. So that's one way to do it. I actually, I think, cheated and did it quicker than that. All right? This one was helpful. Yeah. I went like this and right mouse, copy, oops, paste. And then I gave it the name of, yeah. So I, I wanted it to be French, so I said values.fr. Now you got to know what the actual country codes are. Um, I picked French because, you know, I had two years of high school French and I, I didn't want to waste it. And I'm pretty sure that the country code for French is FR, right? <laughs> so uh, then I went like that. And the nice thing about that is, then that facilitates, because if you go here and edit it, do, 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 you know, you know the things that you have to go and change. So it's, it's like a neat little checklist that, that you, you won't mess one. So, you know, go in the calculator, the bill total, and all that down the line. But the other way, you would have to copy from your other base. Yeah. Yeah. End up at the same, end up at the same destination now. All right. Um, so I do want you to incorporate that. If you've done it already or if you haven't, I want you to incorporate that into your, your next uh, assignment. Now Patrick mentioned he had a problem because his object was expecting the name and the name then all of a sudden was different if it was uh, localized to French. So in other words, if, if he was, ex, uh, you know, his class was, expect, uh, was expecting paper, for example, and when he changed the UI, it now became papier, all right, which means that it wouldn't get a match. Did you yeah, change I, the actual name or did you? Well, I, I, I took the, in my case, the project did the last semester. Where did that into the class, right? I have like four different, I have three different Java classes other than the activity. That, that's a selection based on a device. Yeah. So. Right. Okay. For, for the device. Right. Not for the app. Yeah. Um, question. Um, how would we address that problem? How do we address the problem of, because this is, this is a small app, so it probably wasn't that big of a deal to fix. But in a larger app, that could be a nightmare. How would you fix something like that? Yeah. Uh, Right. If you get this one populated with this string, string value. But the, but the problem was is I'm using using those values in, in other classes. I have I have to show it to you and show you. I mean I in the activity class I had no trouble accessing right. them, but in other classes I couldn't access 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, you could, uh, and again, uh, around it, essentially the idea is, is you want to separate the code that you have for the UI from the business processing. So in some manner, you don't want to pass it literally the value of that string. You want to maybe pass the index of the string, would be one way to do it. Pass the index of the spinner control and just know that you know, zero represents rock, one represents paper, and two represents uh, spinner. Maybe you pass that, and that could even get internally in your class converted to the words rock, paper, and scissors. All right? But the, 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 the key to the answer to that is, and again, we can look at more details, is to make sure that that business logic code, that processing code, is separate from the UI code. Go ahead. You are going to say something, Ben? Here is uh, something I did for. Here's something I did for. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I took the one simple example that we had, and I made a French version of it. And Okay, okay. Let, let, let's, let's defer this till, till um, after. No, that's okay. That's okay. If it was something we could, we could answer quickly, that, that's great. But yeah, let, let's defer this discussion here. Here's my example. I, I went in and made this French and let example, even change the application name, let simple tip calculator, level of service, merde, uh, meh, and fantastique. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you have a different. You have rock paper. Yeah, you have rock paper scissors. So this this wasn't that example. This is that. So what I had to do is I had to go to settings on this. And again, notice everything is is French in this. So settings is parameters or oh, I don't know. I'm going to try stop trying to say. And then you hope you remember what the selection for language is so you can reset it back, which is this one, and then you can go. But again, that's, that's based on the whole device. And now we're back to English, and if we bring up that application, we get the English names and everything for it. Okay. Key is you don't have to change any code. It, it's aware. Uh, the, the way that it works is, again, it will look for that uh, default uh, strings, uh, default values folder. All right? And if, if, uh, if, there is, if there's localized versions of it and the, and the device is set to one of those languages, it will use that. Otherwise, it will use the default. So if someone set it to German, it would use, again, it would use the English because there's no German setting for that. Or there's no German file for that. It definitely makes it Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right, right. And again, the key to that, the key to that in principle, we can look at specifically in your case, but the key to that in principle is make sure that the, the, those things are strictly UI things. And, you know, somehow, 
you, you you'll have to get around that when you when you go and uh, and uh, uh, create the, the the values that you're going to pass to that. All right, we're going to look at today um, another example, uh, the the Twitter search example, and I want to highlight the things that are new about this one. All right. Let me first show you the way that that application works. All right. The application works like this, and we'll go in and we'll talk about the stuff that is different. All right, you have this screen that starts off like this. All right, you have a text box for the, 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 the Twitter search query that you want to run. So whatever your search terms are, you put it in there. You can then give your search query a tag, like a name. All right. Um, you can then save that query, all right, and it will save it in a list that's going to form here. All right. And if you get tired of those, you can clear all of them. You can press the clear and get rid of them. So let's go in and let's do a, a query. Let's say I want to do uh, Android. And I'll, give, uh, I'll tag the query as Android. And I'll click Save. That went and saved it. And now it's in my tagged query list, that button. All right. So it's saved. So I can set up all my queries for Twitter that I wanted to do. I can click on that, and it will go and it will open up and do a search of Twitter and show me all the tweets that have been tagged or that, that come up when I search for Android. Now, a couple things about this. If I go and exit this application, all right, if I go and exit this application, do I have the app killer on this one? No, I don't. Let's go here and let's clobber it this way. Oh, I guess it isn't running. Pardon me? Okay. I'll oh, force stop it. There you go. Okay. If I go in to it again after force stopping it, my favorite Twitter searches are there. So that's one key thing of this. There's some sort of persistence of it. All right. So I can bring this up and I can go and, and, and do it. So that's one key thing of this. The other key thing to this is we have a area here that can scroll. All right, this, this area here for the tag searches will scroll as I add more and more things. Now I won't add enough of them to fill up the space, but I'll add a second one. Notice one thing that's cool, as I click save, the keyboard dis disappears. If I'm also not mistaken, these sort themselves as well as I go and add them. So if I go and search for my iPhone, it does that. I can click edit and go back in and change it 
Android development, let's say, and click Save. And oh, I have to change the tag too. It goes and it adds another one. It's funny how they describe that as being like a feature. Like, and if you go and edit it and change that, it saves it as a new one instead of going back and, and changing the existing one. Well, okay, you know, but uh, they market that as a feature, which, which means that there was, there was a sales rep that did some of the editing on this book, apparently. All right, so that in a nutshell sort of is uh, the key things. Let's look at some specific pieces of code in this, and let, let's see um, what all's going on here. First thing that we're going to notice is just observing the stuff that's different uh, from this app from, from previous is that there's persistence. In other words, it remembers what our selections are. So if I close the app, if I turn it off um, and all that, it, uh, it uh, uh, handles that. All right. The other thing is that there's a scroll view. All right. Um, that as we add more things, it gets bigger and bigger. Let's look at the code here. And start identifying what's responsible for these differences. First thing, under resources, under values, Notice there's actually three separate XML files. There's a colors XML file, there's a dimension XML, and there's a string XML. All right. The string XML is the same old one that we had before. All right. Where we put all those things in. Dimensions allows us to define <laughs> dimensions for a particular uh, device that allows us to again uh, uh, we can you know that is held not inside the code but it's held in a separate file so it can be easily edited again you may wonder like why go to all this trouble all this just adds to the maintainability of it and allows us to, to make it easier to maintain so there's a separate dimension thing and finally there's even a separate color thing um, where they define light orange as that so that you know they can then, throughout the UI, they can refer to that as, as light orange and, and it'll, it'll be okay. All right. I suppose, uh, in, you know, you could go and take and create different versions of these uh, localized. You know, I, you know um, if colors have a particular significance in a different culture, you could go in and you could define different colors for portions of your app, I suppose. Uh, I haven't tried that, but I don't, I don't see why it wouldn't work. You know, just an extension of that. Could you do that also, like, with... Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, you see that as a different color theme. Do you also create the localization that's strictly for land? The, the, the localization that's, yeah, is strictly for device settings. There's no device settings to say you're a Steelers fan versus uh, a Browns fan. You could probably skin it somehow. You could probably create themes and, and programmatically set some of those things, but I don't think you could do it as, as cleanly as you do with, with the localization. All right, so that's the first difference. We have different resource files. Not everything is in the one uh, files. Let's look at the UI and notice that with the UI, we have two XML files. We have a main and we have a new tag view. The main is, I'm going to clear to start out with a fresh slate. 
the main layout, the main XML, is the XML file that gives us, got to be careful with these touch screens, that gives us this layout, that gives us this screen. So it's the same thing that we've been seeing in all the examples. You know, it's our screen. So we do a search and we save it. All of that is the main view, the whole thing. The main view has a portion, though, that expands and gets more stuff added to it. The, 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 the controls for each search that gets added here, all right, the code for that, the XML code for that, is in our second XML file. This guy here, the new tag view. All right. All the new tag view consists of is a couple of buttons actually a table row that contains a couple of buttons. So this is this gets added to that scroll view every time we click a, a, a save. This is sort of the template for adding a new, uh, and this is sort of a nice, uh, a, a nice uh, way to do it because then your, your code isn't really messy with creating all these controls and, and so on. You, you just say you're going to use this to add to your, um, add to your uh, um, scroll view. So here's the main view, the main XML, which is our screen. We look at this. We're using a table layout. All right. We're using, uh, we have several rows. The first row consists of the edit text to enter in the search. So the first row is this guy. The second row consists of an edit text to put in the um, the tag that we're going to call this, what, what we're calling our query, the name for our query, and the button to save it. So that's the second row. The third row is simply the words tag search. All right. In other words, I'm going to use a pen. The words tag search, that's the third row. So row zero, or row one, row two. Finally, table row three is our scroll view. All right. This is what is going to get added to every time we add um, a new search to our list. So it starts out with nothing in it. All right. As we go and we do stuff, uh, more and more stuff gets added to it. Lastly, we have our um, fourth row, or, or row four, which is simply our clear tags button at the very bottom. Okay. In looking at this, notice that Let's see, where do we notice? Notice that here is where we use at color light orange. That's where we use that light orange color that we've defined there. We use... Um, you know, I, I, I thought of that. I believe it seems like you can. As long as you specify the add indicates this in the resource, or I'm sorry, this in the resources values, and then you go from there. I haven't tried that to verify that. Um, I was at, I, actually, as I was running through this, that was a thought that, that popped into my mind, but I, I, I didn't go through uh, and test it. But it sure seems like you can. All right, I don't think co you know, color and that is anything magic. 
the dimensions one we use in this, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. To set the width of the, um, the tag button and the edit button. Repeat that, please. I mean, when, when you're when you're uh, setting the color. Uh huh. Um, oh, not there, but the. Oh, in here. Oh yeah, it says at, at color, and that's called colors. Interesting. Same with strings. Same with strings. Wait, wait, you know what, though? what? The name of your resource is actually color right there. Uh, but never mind. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, that uh, I, I appreciate that. Uh, the, um, excellent. So it seems to be based more on the tag than, than that. It must load all of those XML files and then looks for, for that. Yeah. And that's simply a way to keep things organized, um, uh, make it easier to maintain. All right. Let's look at our activity. All right. First thing that we want to look at here is this line here. Get shared preferences for searches and mode private. Save searches equals is a attribute, an instance variable of a, of a, of a class called shared preferences. All right, and we're using a built-in function that says get shared preferences to pull up and initialize the value of that variable. Well, what is shared preferences? Shared preferences is a uh, is a set of data that contains key names and key values, similar to like you have in the Windows registry, right? In the Windows registry, you have a key name, and then you have a value for that. You can use the shared preferences to set uh, persistent values, all right, for um, any uh, primitive data type. So you can't save classes or, or objects, rather, via save preferences, but you can save any primitive. So Boolean, strings, um, which strictly speaking aren't primitives. Um, and so on. It can, uh, uh, it can save. All right? And it's saved in a manner where you have the name of the element and the value of the element. So it's saved as a pair of things. All right? So the first thing we're doing right off the bat is we're grabbing the stuff that was saved before. When does this on create? Um, method occur? When does that fire up? You know, the first time the activity starts. Other times? Right. If it, if it comes back, so like if I, you know, if I'm working on this and it's like this is boring, I'm going to check my Facebook status and I go in and check that up and then bring it back in. All right, that does it. Actually, if you reorient the screen, it, it fires off too, uh, I believe. So it, it's more than, I, I point that out to say that, that that was a surprise when I find that out. It's more than literally the first time. So it happens under a, a, a few times. All right, but when this fires up, we're grabbing the save preferences. We're grabbing a pointer to that query table layout, which if you remember, is this scroll view. All right, wait a minute. Oh, um, my, my mistake. The query table layout is the whole table.
get a reference to the table layout find by RID table query layout. My scroll panel. Oh, right here. Duh. Oh, okay. This is a table that's inside the scroll view. Um, so yeah, thanks. I, I, I did not notice that was another tag. I thought that was just uh, other attributes with that. Okay. So it's grabbing a pointer to the table that lives inside of the scroll view. All right. The scroll view consists of a table. All right. I think I skipped that the first time around when I was talking about the UI. That's probably why I was confused. All right. We grab pointers to the different text boxes. This is pretty standard. We grab pointers to the buttons. We set our on-click listener to the appropriate on-click listeners. All right. Then we call refresh buttons. We'll go and we'll hit hit up the uh, the uh, uh, button listeners at the appropriate time. So first thing I want to do though is talk about what happens when this loads. When this loads right off the bat, it is going to go and it's going to refresh the buttons. So conceptually what it's doing is is going through that save preferences and it's going to recreate those buttons that were here from the last time. So that's what that refresh buttons indicates. We're passing it a no argument because um, we're not adding anything to that. All right. Um, we'll, we'll use the same function when we're going to add something to uh, our save preferences. So when the application is opened, it grabs the save preferences, it sets those instance variables to point to the proper controls on the screen like we've done in all the other ones. Then it calls refresh buttons. Here's refresh buttons. And we have, um, again, a no argument in this time. What we're, do what we're doing is we're going to go and we're going to go and grab and convert all of those save searches that are in that save search uh, object we're converting that to an array. All right. We then sort that array. All right. That way, as we add things in alphabetical order, uh, or they get put in an alphabetical order. So if I put in a query for AAA, AAA, that gets put in its right spot. If I put something in ZZZ, ZZZ it puts in the right spot, right position. It does that because it takes that save preferences, cranks it into an array, sorts that array, looks to see if there is a null, if that new tag argument is a null or not. We're not adding a new tag right off the bat, right? This is the this is a, we're, we're calling this function from the on create, and we're not adding something new to it. We simply want to go and recreate that list. So that will be a null the first time when it goes. So this won't be won't happen. And then what we do is we go in and we essentially loop through all of those things in the array. All right. And we call a function that says make tag GUI. What does make tag GUI go do? Make tag GUI is the code that actually takes that array and makes physically these buttons in there. All right. So it's going to make those buttons, add it to this, and um, you're in business. All right. Questions about any of this? So really, what we've done so far is We've fired up the application, we've gotten some pointers, we've gotten our save preferences, we created an array out of those preferences so that we can sort it. That's really the only reason to create an array. Um, if we're adding something to it, we're going to go do that, but we're not really adding anything in, uh, the, for the initial load, so we don't we need to worry about that. Then we're going to loop through every single item 
and add it to that that table that's in the scroll view. So let's look and see what make tag GUI does. Go ahead. returns a set of all the keys. In other words, again, it's like a registry where there's a key and a value. The get key set returns all the keys. In this case, the key is our AAA, droid, and not the, not the actual value of the thing that we're searching. All right. Okay. So let's look at make tag GUI, which is here. All right, so how does this work? We're actually using a Android service called an inflator. And what an inflator does allows us to inflate something, allows us to add, we're inflating that table, essentially. We're adding stuff to that table. All right, so what are we adding to it? We're adding a view to it. All right. So here's where we create our object for that service. Here's where we're adding a new view to it. And what is that new view? The new view is each one of these rows in turn. Each one of these rows is a view. So as we loop through this, the first time through the loop, this will be the new view that we add. The second time, this will be the new view. Third time, this will be the new view. Now notice what we are using here. How are we inflating it? We are inflating it using that XML file for our layout. So in other words, we're not just adding anything to it or we're not adding some null view to it. We're adding a specific view. We're adding these specific components to it. All right. And what controls that is the fact that we are, when we inflate it, and create that new tag view, we're using that XML to do it. So now, we need to grab a pointer to those two new buttons that we created, right? Let's imagine we're looping through this. So, we're looping through and let's say the first time through, we've just added that, we've just added that view all right, we've just inflated and created that view. We need to point to this button and point to that button so that we can go and say, gee, set the value of that or set the text of that button, set the, the, the text of that one. All right, so that's what we're doing here. All right, here's the new tag view that we've created. You know, new row would probably make more sense for me, but, you know. Strictly speaking, it is a view. We're now pointing to those individual controls on those on that new row. We're pointing to the tag button, and we're pointing to the edit button. We set the text of that to the tag. All right. So the text of this button gets set to whatever our key value was. What they're calling in this example the tag. So for the first one it sets it to AAA. The other thing that we do is for both the tag and the edit button we set the listeners. All right. And again, we won't look at those listeners right this minute, but we'll uh, look at them um, either the end of class, today, either later class today, or or class next time. So what have we done at this point? We have we we've we've blown up this new table row. We've inflated this new table row, and we're getting it ready. How are we getting it ready? 
While we're pointing to it, we're setting the text for the one button. We're setting the listener for that button. We're setting the text. Well, actually, we're not setting the text because all of these have a value of edit. But we're setting the listener for the edit button. Now we need to go and add to that table layout that new table row that we created. All right. So there's an add view to that query table layout that's going to add a new row to that table. So again, the table, uh, the query table layout is that table that's inside of the scrolling view. All right. And here we're actually adding that row that we've inflated or constructed using that XML file. We're actually adding that to there. Now. Okay, we didn't call set text for the edit button, so how did it know what the text was? Well, we defined in here, Android text for that is at string edit. So, that's how it got the value. Notice how, for the other one, whoops, we don't even define the text for it, right? Because we know we're setting that one programmatically. So we don't, we don't define that. We could, I guess, define a, a, a placeholder value and override it, but there's really no point to that. So what we have now is we have this. All right. Let's, let's go in and review that. Let, let's take it all the way through fast forward. Application fires up or is refreshed. All right. We grab the shared preferences. We grab pointers to our different things on our page or on our, on our uh, GUI. We set some listeners and then we say refresh buttons to create that table that's in the scroll view. All right. That refresh buttons is going to loop through those saved searches that we have. All right, well, first it's going to crank them into an array. We sort the array. We then are going to loop through them, and for each iteration, we call this make tag GUI. What does the make tag GUI do? The make tag GUI uses the inflator to create a new view based on that XML layout. We grab pointers to the things in that, in that new view. We set their values and set their listeners. Then we go and we add that to the query table view. Now, by virtue of that table view being inside a scroll view, if this table gets to be too big, then a scroll bar will be created. All right. So, we're at the initial load that it went and it loaded. Let's now go and work our way through what happens when we add a query. So I go in here and I type in, oops, iPhone. Notice something that's a little subtle. Let's zoom in on this. On the keyboard, I'm in. I'm in the first text box. On the keyboard, this button says next. So when I click the next button, what happened? The focus went to the next text box. And notice now that that button that used to say next says done. All right. And when I click done, the keyboard goes away. All right. 
Let's take a second to see how that mechanism works. All right. That mechanism is actually attributes on our GUI. Here, that's for the first text box, sets the act, oops. Here is the action on the first text box. It sets that action button to be next, right? Because if you fill in the, te the first text field, you should then be able to go and click and go on to the next text field. Notice the next text field has the option for done. So that after we exit or, or as we're typing in that, that button changed from next to done. All right. And again, it, 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 these things have their default behaviors. Next, if I set the action for next, that takes it simply to the next thing that, that can get focus on, 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 uh, on the GUI. If it's done, done um, gets rid of the, the soft keyboard. All right? And, and, you know, and, and then you go from there, you press the button or whatever. So that's something that's kind of subtle and it's easy to miss, but, but again, you know, you can pay, atten pay attention to that to see uh, how that goes. All right, so anyhow, so we've entered in a new query. All right, and we click save. Let's see what save does. Well, how do we know what save does? Well, we can look up here, that save button, which indeed is the thing on the page that has an ID of save button, which if we look at the layout, is indeed that save button, <laughs> all right. We've set the listener to be save button listener. So let's go and look at that. We make a public on click listener of save button listener equals new on click listener. And we have our on click event coded here. I was actually thinking about your question about the, is this, is this uh, sort of a violation of uh, OO principles by doing that. Um, that's probably best left to the PhDs to decide for sure. But I would say it's okay because this is like a member of this class. This is part of this class, so it, it's entitled to see stuff inside of it. Yeah, well, actually, there's a completely different way to do it. Instead of doing an anonymous inner class, you say class activity extends activity, mm -hmm. implements. Yes. Yeah, you can do that. You can do that. You can do that if there's, you can do that like for like one listener, right? Oh, then you'd have to get the ID of, of the thing that was clicked. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, so. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I guess you could do that. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. You could, you could do that. All right, so what are we doing here? Well, first of all, we're validating to make sure that uh, there's something in uh, both the, the query and the tag text box. We then call make tag. All right. We haven't seen make tag yet. All right. So let's go and look at make tag. Where was that? It was up here. All right. Now, what are we doing with this? We are going in and Original query will be null if we're modifying an existing search. Okay. Yeah, it's looking up for previous values of that. All right.
spacer. Yeah, okay, it's grabbing the value, all right, from there, and is then using the, the shared preference editor to edit the save searches and put in the new values. Okay, what this line does is this line looks to see if it's already in the safe searches. And um, original query will be null if we're modifying an existing. I, I got notes. I got notes. Yeah. Reading through what I have in here. So this, this lifts up the previous value if any associated. Right. 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 So that's what it's doing. I'm trying to figure out what this. Okay. But this comment seems backwards. Original query will be null if we're modifying an existing search. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. It seems like it would be, it, yeah, it would seem like it would be null if we're adding a new search because what we're doing is we're looking through the saved searches for that tag. And if we find it, we'll get the value for it. If we don't find it, we'll get a null. So, yeah, the comment has to be wrong in that case. Right. Um, it, it, the Deedles have been in business for a long time, and I'm sure they would say they do that deliberately to to help you learn and to figure it out on your own or something like that. All right, uh, I don't think I've taught long enough to say that convincingly, but uh, you know. At any rate, yeah, that 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 comment has to be wrong. So anyhow, so original query will have the value um, in there if it is. Um, if, if you're editing something, otherwise it will be null. So here we're going in and we're adding and applying the new tag and the new query here. If we wrote this more sophisticated, we could allow them to, to re simply replace the query uh, with the new tag. We could get rid of the one tag and add the new one. But for simplicity's sake, they're just having it so that if you edit it and change the name of the tag, it, it adds a brand new one. And then here, to your point, Ben, if um, if you um, if that tag wasn't there before, now you need to go and refresh. All right. If the tag was already there, you don't really need to do anything. So don't waste the time. So it goes in and it calls refresh buttons, which we've seen before, but it calls it with the tag argument. All right. And the tag argument, when we call refresh buttons, we go in and we make tag GUI new tag and we look for where it belongs in the new position. We do a binary search to see where the new tag fits in so that when we make tag GUI, it puts it in at the appropriate place. All right. Um, that way you don't have to redo those tags each time. All right. The, the, the bonehead way to do this would be to no matter what, go in and um, call that those that refresh buttons. But they're a little more sophisticated than that. Um, what they do is they uh, find out um, what was I looking at? 
Yeah. When, uh, when you're refreshing the buttons, if you're simply adding a new tag, it will go in and it will call that make GUI function and give it simply the one tag and it will give it um, the position where it needs to insert it. When you're looping through, it gets the position from the position in the array. So the zeroth element it puts in the zeroth row of the table and so on down the line. All right, so that's most of this application. All right, what pieces do we need to cover? We need to cover what happens when you hit at it. We need to cover what happens if you hit clear. And we need to cover what happens when you actually hit this button. And it does a Twitter search. Now one thing I will say, um, if I run this on my phone, which I did, it behaves a little bit differently than on here. Because this, uh, this device does not have the Twitter app installed, whereas my phone has the Twitter. Um, and we'll, we'll go over that next time. But it gets into what are called intents. And uh, in other words, it's almost like, you know, like in Windows, you could have several programs to open a JPEG file, for example. And there's a default, and then there's the other file, uh, other things that you could use. When there's more than one, thing that could process a particular intent, it brings up a dialogue and asks you, what do you want to handle that? You know, what do you want to, to use to handle this? Do you want to open the Twitter app or do you want to, um, you know, just do it in the browser? All right. So we'll polish that off next time. Questions about this? If I am not mistaken, you are scheduled for a quiz this week. <laughs> uh, I will post uh, something tomorrow about that. Uh, it is likely that I might, uh, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do. This kind of snuck up on me a little bit. I might, my options are to postpone it a week or to devote part of the class time to it or to make it like an online, just take it sometime over the weekend. So I promise it won't be too, too grueling. All right. Um, but anyhow, um, look over the next day or so and I'll, I'll, I'll have posted um, an update to that. All right. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. On, on the assignment? Yeah. On the um, currency? Yes. The icon that we're supposed to put an image here. Okay. Okay. I just went and grabbed something. And yeah. It's just, it's, it's very small. It's not like in the Hello World app. You know, yeah. The, the bug and, you know, it's bug. Right. So I was wondering, how, how do we, in the assignment, it says to use the HDI image, but I was grabbing something off the web. I save it as a PNG. I don't know whether, what, what the DPI setting of it is. I didn't. Okay. HTTPI folder it worked, but it's not that big, and I don't know whether it's high quality or, or, well, let's, or not. So. Let's see if there's any guidelines for that. Determining image sizes. 
Uh, create an image for. Let's see. Okay. All right. Let's move in for resource. My understanding to create three unique interfaces would be the West Vale Go supporting all devices. Yes, uh, I know there's some request posts. If I create an image for the benchmark MDPI and I say that image is 300 by 210, how would I determine what size I would need to recreate that image at L LDPI and HDPI? This post leads me to believe that LDPI is 75% and it's 150%. Is that accurate? Um, if you want a two inch image, it would need to be 240. Okay, a 320 pixel image is two inches on an MDPI. So if you want two inches on an LDPI, it would have to be 240 pixels. And if you want a two inch picture on a HDPI, it would need to be 480 pixels. All right, does that help? Okay. I, I guess the thought is, is you decide how much, how big you want the picture to be, you know, and figure out how, how big you want it to be, like on a medium uh, density, and then you go and you can scale it um, down and, and up for the other density ones. Right. But they're, they're, you know. Yeah. 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 Um, the uh, Joe uh, Joey was saying that um, there was he experienced some rounding error when he used doubles, but um, that that'll be fine. Army. Right. Right. No, he's he's here some of the days, uh, but. Um, I, th I think I think he can't make um, some of the lectures, so he he views them uh, views them online. All right.